Hello everybody, this is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. This video that you're about to see is the second in a series of videos concerning New Covenant Theology. Not Covenant Theology, but New Covenant Theology. It's a part of my overall uh, playlist, which I call New Covenant Theology. And this playlist has six videos describing Covenant Theology and nine videos discovering dispensationalist theology. This is a background for understanding the three theological systems that try to answer the fundamental question of what is the relationship between the Old and New Covenants. This particular video will, uh, con will continue an overview of New Covenant theology that I started in my last video. And in this one, I'm going to emphasize, I'm going to talk about how the New, co the new Testament emphasizes the New over the old. And so we're going to be talking about the new and new covenant theology. All right, now let's uh, look at my overview uh, in the first part of my PowerPoints here. Uh, I talked about the the eternal question of what, uh, uh, what is what is the relationship between the old and new covenant? Is it continuous? Or is it discontinuous? And we found out that new covenant theology says that it's partially continuous and partially discontinuous, whereas covenant theology emphasizes continuity too much, in my humble opinion, and dispensationalist theology emphasizes discontinuity too much. Then we gave a definition of New Covenant Theology, a summary of New Covenant Theology, and implications of New Covenant Theology, just to get a background, to get an overview of New Covenant Theology. Now we're going to emphasize the new in New Covenant Theology. How do we emphasize the new in New Covenant Theology? All right, well, getting started here, I'm going to look at go through a lot of things that are new in the New Covenant and answer the question, so what's new? And then once we f find out that there are a lot of new things in our covenant, in the New Covenant, we're going to start, we're going to ask the question, well, what does the new do to the old? If we have the new, does that mean the old is obsolete or do we keep the old around? I'm going to use an analogy of a car. I buy a new car, I put it in the garage, I drive it around. What do I do with my old car? Do I throw it in the junkyard? Or do I put it in a museum? Well, the New Covenant analogy is you put it in a museum. You don't drive it anymore. It's not, what's, it's not for you anymore. However, it's still valuable. It was great in its time, and it has lots, brings back lots of fond memories. The, the Covenant Reform position says that we take the car and uh, we, we have a new car, and we have the old car, and we get in the old car and drive it. Sometimes, and sometimes we get in the new car and drive it, but we got that old car is still running. So this is mostly going to be, as I go through this overview of New Covenant Theology, it's mostly going to show how New Covenant Theology contradicts Covenant Theology or Reformed Theology. We're not going to be picking on dispensationalists too much in this video. Let's start out with a great verse here in Revelation 21, 5. Behold, I am making all things new. In my, in my Orthodox Protestant interpretation of Revelation, I believe that that book was talking about the coming of the new covenant, not the new heaven, the so-called new heavens and new earth at the end of the age, the final state. I think it's referring to the new covenant church, which culminates in the, uh, the final state, but it's mainly talking about the new covenant that's here now. And so that's why I quote this verse, I'm making all things new, new in the new covenant. If you don't hold to an Orthodox brother's view, that's okay. There's still lots of other verses that talk about the new covenant being new. All right, so what's new? I'm going to give you a summary of what the Scripture says what's new. The new covenant, and we have a new covenant. We have a new relationship with God, free from legalism. That's number two. Number three, we have a new teaching. Number four, we have a new law. Number five, we have a new humanity, a new man. Number six, we have a new way of life. Number seven, we have a new people of God. And number eight, we sing a new song. So let's start and go through the Scriptures for each one of these. The scriptures showing that we have a new covenant, Luke 22, 20, says this, and in the, in the same way, this is talking about the communion, and in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So right there, the first Lord's Supper, which is a very important 
ordinance in the church, Jesus calls it the new covenant. He was, he was initiating the new covenant. And Paul, referring back to this event in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, says this, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now let me ask you, does Luke or Paul, do they say, This cup which is poured out for you is the new administration of the old covenant of grace? Excuse me, the new administration of the covenant of grace in my blood? Well, that's the way the Reformed people would say it. Not that they actually do, but if they logically follow the logic of their system, they're always talking about the new administration of the covenant of grace. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says the new covenant, period, full stop, end of story. All right, how about this? 2 Corinthians 3, 6, still talking about a new covenant. He also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, Paul tells the Corinthians, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, this doesn't mean that the new covenant is antinomian, to use the Reformers' favorite words. It doesn't mean that we go around and say, well, just how the Spirit leads me. We don't need to look at the Scripture. We don't need, we don't care. No, it means uh, a new covenant which has its origin in the Spirit and which new covenant is the law of Christ written on our hearts, which consists of specific commands and ordinances that fulfill Jesus' law of love, his, his, the law of Christ. We're not antinomians. I'm really overemphasizing that to counteract the uh, often made charge by reformers that New Covenant the theologians are antinomian. No, they are not antinomian. They are neonomian. They believe in a new law, the law of Christ. Hebrews 8.8 8 says this, For he finds fault with them, his people, the Holman Christian Study Bible says, he finds fault with his people, the Jews, when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, of course, that cannot be interpreted literally as the dispensationalists do. This is referring to the church. Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 31 is, in, is fulfilled in the church. And this new covenant is with the church. And if, if we doubt that, we could go to a few later verses in Hebrews. Hebrews 9.15 says this, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Obviously it's talking about the church, because what other covenant would Jesus be the mediator of? Hebrews 12.24 says this, Jesus the mediator of a new covenant. So here we have a new lawgiver, a new mediator, the new high priest, the mega priest, if you will, the mediator of a new covenant. So we're in a new covenant now, and this should be our emphasis, not Moses, not the old covenant law like reformers do, and not, and we shouldn't de-emphasize the new covenant. The scriptures certainly don't. We shouldn't keep calling the new covenant as a new administration of the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace is a man-made theological term which does not exist in the scripture, and, well, I know the Trinity doesn't exist in the Scripture either, either, but there's a lot more evidence for the Trinity than there is for a covenant of grace. I'll tell you that right now. All right, so that's the first thing that's new. Oh, and let's continue continuing on with the idea of us being in a new covenant. I'm going to take Revelation, and again, as I said, I take an Orthodox Preterist viewpoint on the Revelation. I believe it's talking about the new covenant. And along with that line, uh, along with that way of thinking, let's read Revelation 3.12. John says this, <clears throat> or actually this is Jesus speaking through John, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, which means name means possession. So that means the Christians who overcome and who conquer, who are upholding the temple or the church of God uh, as, a, as a pillar of strength. you got your name stamped on your head as belonging to God, and you got the name of the city of my God. That means the church, the name of the city of God, which is the New Jerusalem. So New Jerusalem is stamped on your head, which means you belong to the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem is the church, which comes down from God out of heaven, my own new, na my own new name. So you got the name of Jesus. you got the name of New Jerusalem on your head as a believer because you're in the New Covenant. Revelation 21, 1 through 2 continues this theme, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And again, I don't believe that's the final state. I believe uh, John is referring to the establishment of the new covenant. Again, that, that's a lot of theology behind that. So just take, that's just my opinion right now. If you don't believe, if you believe this is the first of the final state, that's all right. It doesn't 
take away from New Covenant theology one bit. I'm just trying to say that I believe that John in Revelation is continuing the theme that, they, that we uh, live in a New Covenant era. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And I believe that's referring to the old covenant rabbinic uh, system of Israel. It has passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. As a bride, that's the church, the bride of Christ, New Jerusalem, the new covenant. All right. Now, the second thing that's new in the New Testament scriptures is this we have a new relationship with god which is free from legalism matthew 9 17 says this neither is new wine put into old wine skins if it is the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed and that's because the old wine is stretched as far as it can stretch you put new wine in, in it and it ferments it bubbles it creates alcohol which then i guess I don't know the chemistry involved, but it uh, increases the gases that come off the top of the wine, which then expand the pressure on the inside of the old stretched out wineskins, and kaboom, the wineskin breaks, the wine is spilled out on the, on the uh, ground. Well, that's not us. We are new wine, and we've got to be put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. The fresh wineskins, the new covenant. Now, let me say here, uh, again, I'm going to be uh, kind of ragging on the Reformed Covenant the theologian's position here. Um, covenant theologians will agree with all this, and they'll say, but what is really contrasted in the New Testament is the old system of the Pharisees against the New Covenant uh, teachings of Jesus, and that there is no contrast really between the Law of Moses and the New Covenant of Jesus. The relationship is flat. We move on into the from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant with no elevation of the Old Law in the hands of Jesus. Jesus is just re-administering. He's just showing the how to properly administer the Law of Moses. He's not trying to abrogate the Law of Moses. He's just jumping on the Pharisees for screwing up the Law of Moses. Well, uh, as we go through these verses, sometimes I think it's clear that Jesus is preaching against the legalism of the Pharisees, and I don't want to uh, quibble that point with the Reformed people. But in some of them, I'm going to show you that he's actually talking about we have a new relationship, and we're no longer under the law of Moses. The Pharisees' traditions were horrible, but the law of Moses, of course, is holy and good. But nonetheless, we're not under the holy law of Moses either, because we're in a new age. Redemptive historical history has moved on. All right. Another similar parable is in Mark 2.21, talking about our new relationship with God free from legalism. And I believe here he's talking about the legalism of the Pharisees. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. That's because the old garment on the outside has been stretched out as far as it can. The new garment, which covers the pat, covers the tear, the new patch that covers the tear, it is not stretched out as far as it can, and so then it starts, excuse me, it starts shrinking. It starts shrinking. The old garment has shrunk as far as, not stretched out, but it's shrunk, shrunk as far as it can, and then the new patch is not shrunk as far as it can, Go and so it shrinks some more and then pulls away from the uh, unshrunk cloth around the patch around the tear and it rips the shirt up. Great analogy, means the same thing as the old wineskin analogy. Legalism is no good, new covenant's good. Well, we'll agree with the reformers on that. Now, the third thing that's new is the new teaching. Uh, Mark records this about the people who were watching Jesus and listening to him, and they were all amazed. This is in Mark chapter 1, verse 27. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. Because the Old Testament rabbis, excuse me, the uh, rabbis who were teaching at the time of Jesus, they would always quote authorities. Rabbi Hillel says this. Rabbi Shemai, Shemai says this. And on and on and on and on. But Jesus says, I tell you this, because he was the ultimate teacher. And he had a new teaching, and it had authority. And that's the teaching we're under, the law of Christ, as NCT people like to say, New Covenant theology people like to say. All right, the fourth new thing that we have in the New Covenant is a new law. 1 John, 2, chapter eight, 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. 
It is a new commandment that I am writing to you. And of course, a commandment is a law. It is a new law or a new commandment that I am writing to you, John says to his readers. This new commandment is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Notice the darkness under the old that's this implied. We don't want to stay under the darkness. We want to stay under the new. Now, I don't know whether he's talking about uh, Moses here that's the old, the old covenant. Wouldn't surprise me. Or is it, if he's talking about the Pharisees. Either way, we're under the law of Christ. Now, we're not under the law of Moses or the Pharisees. John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. A new commandment that I give to you. This is a favorite NCT verse, New Covenant Theology verse. A new law I give to you, a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You notice that the new law of Christ is not as detailed as the Mosaic law because it's, re it's governing relationships between people in the church who have the Holy Spirit living within them and who are regenerate. When I say regenerate, I mean 99%, as far as we can make it regenerate, none of this visible church stuff Half, part of the church is saved and part of the church is not saved, but we give everybody infant baptism to make sure that even the unsaved people are part of the covenant, part of the visible church. No, none of that. We're, we're saved. We're in the church. We have the Holy Spirit, and therefore Jesus can say, love one another. Moses couldn't do that because he was governed a bunch of reprobates. Most of the Old Testament people were not believers, did not have the faith of Abraham, and did not believe in God as the history of the Old Testament shows. So we have a new law now, a new lawgiver who gave his law on a new mountain, the, the, where he gave the sermon on the mount. Moses gave the law on Sinai. Jesus gave the sermon of the mount on a new mountain, another mountain. So what's new? Again, the fifth thing, and we have a new humanity. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old man is dead. The new man is alive. By the way, that's great teaching on sanctification. Don't let people tell you that you've got an old man and a new man. And the reformers are not the only one who do this. Lots of people do it. I think even Watchman Nee did it. And even some of these Keswick people did it, who the reformers don't like. But uh, no, the old man is dead. Paul clearly says that in Romans 6. The old man is dead. So if the old man is dead, how does he still live in you? It's your flesh, to be theologically accurate. It's your flesh that comes up and creates your, a, a pull to sin. But that's not your new nature. Your new nature is a born-again child of God, adopted into the kingdom, redeemed from slavery and from death, regenerated, born again, Positionally sanctified in preparation for a lifetime of sanctification, which will eventuate and, uh, into a total transformation into a glorified new creation. So that kind of sort of, you know, that's good news. We're not under the law for that, folks. We're not under the Old Testament Mosaic law for that. We're not, and of course we're not under the, uh, the traditions of the Pharisees or the traditions of evangelical American Christianity. All right, here's another verse. Galatians 6.15 says this, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? But a new creation. That's what counts, a new creation, and that's us. We are created anew. So we have a new humanity in the New Testament. Colossians 3.10, You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is a great new man teaching that uh, so many people screw up especially reformers, talking about the old man, the old man, the old man. No, we're a new creation. The reformers, they love the old. But we love the new. Number six, a new uh, <coughs> something new in the uh, New Testament scriptures, the sixth new thing, a new way of life. Romans 7, 6 says this, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, that's Moses, but in the new life of the Spirit. So here Paul contrasts the Old Testament law. We are released from that. The law, That Old Testament law of Moses held us captive, kept pointing out they were sin, which is a good thing, but it basically held us captive. We couldn't get loose. So now we serve not under the old written code of Moses, but in the new life of the Spirit. What well, could be clear? And this just kills me. How reformers can read verses like this and say, no, 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 we still have Moses for the rule of life. I don't understand it. I, you read this verse and it's just as clear as it can be. No, you don't serve under the old written code. You do not go and have the law of Moses 
bind your conscience as a rule of life. You serve in a new life of the Spirit. And again, this new life of the Spirit, it does not mean, do, 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 tell me, Holy Spirit, what I do. It means the Holy Spirit guides you through the Word of Jesus. And also, by the way, Reformers, sometimes the Holy Spirit can directly uh, uh, teach you and guide you like with a word of wisdom, a word of revelation. Oh, God forbid that, uh, that I would talk about charismatic extremism when I say that. But, you know, hey, the Holy Spirit does lead people. Because, you know, I look in the Bible, I don't see where it's, I'm supposed to marry this person or take this job. And yet, I have, I have read reformers who say this. The only way that the Holy Spirit will work is through the Word. It's an overemphasis. We need the Word. We need the Spirit. We need both. We don't need the uh, Word to the exclusion of even direct revelations of the Holy Spirit. I know that can be abused, but we don't need to take the abuse. If the Holy Spirit is, in, in, if any direct revelation you have, if it doesn't contradict the Word, you have to make a decision. Did I hear right or did I hear wrong? But the, the Word sometimes doesn't speak to every situation in life. But anyway, enough of that digression about Reformers uh, pneumatology and their views on sanctification and guidance. I'm just saying here as a general proposition, Paul says we're released from the Old Testament law. We're died to it. It's dead to us. It held us captive, but no more. We're free. We serve not under the old written code of Moses. That's not talking about the Pharisees. It's talking about Moses. We don't serve under that anymore, but in the new life of the Spirit. What could be clearer? Hebrews 10.20 says this, By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through the flesh, so the author of Hebrews refers to a new and living way. He's opposing that to the law of, of uh, the Old Testament law <clears throat> and also the traditions of the Pharisees that the uh, Hebrew Christians, the Jewish Christians in, uh, that were addressed by the book were attempted to go back to the old way that led to death. But this way is a new and living way. And that's, of course, the way we're supposed to live. All right, going on here, the seventh thing that's new in the New Covenant, that we have a new people of God now. Ephesians 2.15 says this, By abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, Paul says, that he might create in himself, Jesus might create in himself, one new man. Now here it's not talking about an individual man, but it's a metaphor referring to the church. One new man means the, is the church in place of the two old men, the Jew and the Gentile, who were split out in the Old Covenant. Gentiles were not allowed access, not directly, into the Old Covenant commonwealth. So there's peace now. And how do we get that peace? Because the law of commandments and ordinances has been abolished. We, is that the law of the Pharisees? I don't think so. I think that's talking about Moses. His law has been abolished as far as us. It doesn't mean it's bad. It was good for its time. But it's not in effect for the New Testament Christian today. Still talking about a new people of God, let's look what Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 6.16. And it's for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, upon the Israel of God. Peace and mercy upon the Jewish Christians in the church. That's what the dispensationalists say. No, it's talking about the church. Now the Reformers do believe, agree with NCT people on that. But my point is, is now the Israel of God is now the church, one new man. We have a new people of God now. The Old Testament people of God was Israel. The New Testament people of God is the church, the kingdom of God. All right, the eighth new thing that we see in the New Testament. Christians now sing a new song, in which I believe just summarizes all the other new song things that we've done. It was sing about it. Revelation 5, 9, and they, referring to Christians, sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. It's talking about the Lamb of God and the vision. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That shows the universal aspect of the gospel, a universal penetration all through every, to every corner of the globe of the gospel of Christ, the church of Christ. All of us, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, we're going to be singing a new song. Not the song of Moses, but the song, but the song of the Lamb. Revelation 14, 13 says this, And they were singing a new song before the throne. This is, of course, the saints. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. A new song. All right. Now, we've looked at what's new. There's a lot of new stuff in the New Covenant. And I ask you, when's the last time you heard a Reformed Presbyterian preacher talk about that? 
I don't think you're going to hear it very much. Now, of course, I'm not in every corner of the Reformed universe, so I don't know that that's not done. But I listen to an awful lot of Reformed podcasts and read a lot of Reformed articles, and I have yet to re- to see anybody collect all that new stuff and put it together. And I think the reason is is because Reformers, in my opinion, and my Reformers are fixated upon that Old Testament Mosaic Law, and they're trying to defend it against those nasty antinomians. And don't get me wrong, there are real antinomians out there. They're out there. But NCT is not antinomian. It's not even close. All right, so now that we have established what's new, the next question is, is does the new obsolete the old? I gave you at the beginning of this video a metaphor, or excuse me, a, uh, an analogy. Let's say you buy a new car. You've got your old car in your garage. You buy a new one and park next to it. Now the question is, is what do you do with that old car? Well, you could just take it to the junkyard, put some dynamite in it, blow it up, spit on it, say, golly, I hated this car. It was nothing but trouble the whole time. That would be an, in, uh, 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 an inappropriate attitude to take towards your old car because you love that old car. It drove you before you had the new car. It got you where you wanted to go, uh, and it did its job. But now the new car is bigger. It holds more people. It has less gas mile. It, it runs on less gas. Uh, it's more comfortable. It's got more options. It's just a better car all the way around. So you say, okay, well, I've got a better car now, so I'm going to not use the old car anymore. And as it gets older, as it gets older and older, you say, you know, I'm going to put that old car in a museum. I'm going to put it in a, um, an antique car museum. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I've got fond memories of it. I'm going to look and see how the, the technology that was developed on that old car led to the technology that's on this new car. But I'm not going to drive it again. That is the proper attitude, and that's the NCT attitude, okay? Uh, the reformer's attitude is, uh, let's get the old car and drive it some more. Well, we got this new car. We'll drive it sometimes, but, you know, to really get where we want to go, we've got to get back in the old car and drive it. Because the old car uh, in, uh, incorporates many of the old features of the old car. It's just a new administration of the old car. And uh, everything the old car does, new car does, it has four wheels, it has a steering wheel, it has a, ga- a gas pedal. You know, it's basically the same car, not much different. It's just, you know, there's a few features that are different. That's the Reformed Covenant view of the Law of Moses and the New Covenant Law of Christ. I submit to you that the New Covenant theology view is much, much, much superior. All right, so let's look at how the new obsoletes the old. We're going to not drive that old car anymore. Hebrews 8.13 says this. When I say new, I mean the new covenant obsoletes the old covenant. Hebrews 8.13 says this. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. I think that's referring to God, makes the first one obsolete, or Jesus. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Vanish. You don't use something that's vanishing as your rule of life. And it says ready to vanish because this was written right before 87. I think 87, boom, is when all the old covenant stuff was thoroughly, with a punctuation mark, uh, wiped out of history. So the first covenant is obsolete. It's like your old car. It's obsolete. You don't drive it anymore. Now here's, I gave you that nice analogy, but here's two two more analogies. Do people who live in New England live under the laws of Old England? No. Now, does that mean they trashed the laws of Old England? No. Did they, in Massachusetts Bay Colony, did they use some of the Old England common law? Of course they did. They brought it over. They used Blackstone. Um... And they had lots, uh, they used the Old Test, the old English laws as templates and as uh, analogies and as, pre- you know, they did it, they used it, but they weren't under it. They even used it as precedent sometimes, but they weren't under it because a court in New England had to say, hey, that old English law, we affirm it right here in, in Massachusetts, in, in, in New England, we affirm the old covenant laws of England. That's a pretty good analogy because... Uh, we appreciate the law of Moses, but we're not under it. It does not govern our Christian lives anymore. Here's another analogy. If two parties rescind an old contract and sign a new contract, which one is valid? Well, I can tell you right now, the old contract is legally worthless. The parties, A and B, are not under that old contract. It's over. It's done. 
It's gone bye-bye. You put it in a file cabinet. Now, you can pull it out later and use it for some ideas or for a template to sign a new contract, and the parties can sign a new contract, but it's the new contract which has legal validity and legal um, jurisdiction over the two parties. And likewise, the law of Moses no longer has jurisdiction over the Christian. The deal now is between Jesus and us. We're under a new covenant, not an old covenant. All right, folks, this ends our second uh, PowerPoint, excuse me, our second video as we continue through our New Covenant PowerPoints. In our next PowerPoint, we're going to look at how the old becomes new, and we're going to look at specific things which are typical, typologically shifted uh, to an eschatological fulfillment, an antitypical fulfillment as we go from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. I hope you enjoyed this video. hope you subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoy the next one, too.